All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Now, the majority of this chapter, not all of it, the majority in the first part is <coughs> dealing with, basically it's going to be dealing with payment and for doing the work of the Lord. And we're going to see that there's, there's certain people out today that don't believe that pastors should be getting paid and they have a whole different concept of how the church ought to be run. But really, it's very clear and we're going to get into that tonight. Let's just start off here in verse number one. We'll start going through these verses. There's quite a bit of content, so I'm going to try to get through this as quick as I can. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 1, Am I not an apostle? Am, am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you. For the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. So he starts off just kind of say, you know, stating, and you know, a lot of people have questioned Paul and and. People were saying bad things about Paul, I think, in the church of Corinth, and there's been a lot of rumors and bad things going on about him. But um, we see here now he's just starting off saying, look, am I not an apostle? He's like, I am one of the people that was chosen specifically by Jesus Christ to be an apostle because what, you know, the one thing that's true of all the apostles is that they saw Jesus Christ like physically. They, were around, they weren't just believers, you know, after the fact, after his resurrection, they saw Jesus Christ. And that's why the Apostle Paul said that he was the least of the apostles. And he said he was like one born out of due time. Why? Because when he actually saw Jesus Christ, it was when he was you know, on, his road, on the road to Damascus after the resurrection when Jesus Christ literally appeared to Paul. So he did get to see the, resur you know, the resurrected Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ called him to be an apostle, which is what he is. He says, have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? So what he's doing now is he's explaining that, look, you know, other people, you know, if I'm not an apostle unto them, nevertheless, I'm an apostle unto you. Why? Because they are a result of his apostleship. They are a result of the work that Paul has been doing that was given to him by the Lord Jesus Christ. This church at Corinth exists, exists because of the work that Paul did going out and preaching the gospel. Paul's fruit is his converts. And I just want to point out real quick, if you want to flip back to Matthew chapter 7, there's a, a passage in Matthew 7 that frequently is mis, misused and misapplied. And people will try to take this passage and teach that this is how you know that somebody's saved, is based on their fruit. And, and this would be similar, similar to the conversation we had with this lady out soul winning today. Not exactly the same, but you know, people always want to look to see if someone else is saved. Now, I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with, with um, you know, if someone's just living a total wicked life, just totally in sin, to make an assumption that they're not saved. And the reason why I say that I don't think it's a bad thing is because then, hey, you'll be thinking, well, this person isn't quite living right. It doesn't mean that they're not saved, but if you just make that assumption is based on what you see, well, then you should be more likely to bring up the gospel, bring up Jesus Christ, bring these things up, and hopefully be able to motivate them then to getting right with God if they are saved. And if they're not saved, then giving them the gospel and getting them saved, just as that motivational factor. But we cannot, I don't think that this is, I know for sure that Matthew 7 is not designed to be the judgment on just your average believer. And here's what I'm talking about. Look at verse number 15 of Matthew 7. The Bible says, Beware of false prophets. So right here, what we're getting into is false prophets. People who are prophets, right? Preaching a form of godliness, right? Someone who's preaching, maybe they're, they're claiming the name of the Lord. Maybe they're claiming the name of Jesus. Who knows what they're claiming? But they're a prophet, but they're a false prophet. They're not preaching correctly. They're not preaching what's right. They're preaching damnation. It says, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. This is talking about bad people who look good on the outside, but on the inside, they're really, really wicked. Verse 16, ye shall know them by their fruits. Who are we going to know by their fruits? What we just read in verse 15, the wolves in sheep's clothing, the people who are really bad on the inside, but they want to put on a show like they're good. See, what people don't get, right? You, know, you should know them by their fruits. 
People like to take the outward appearance and say somehow that that's their fruits, right? So like, if somebody's living like they're a drunk or involved in some other sins, that's what people will look to and say, see, it's their fruits. They must not be saved because of their fruits. That's not what this is talking about at all. This is talking about a person who, on the outside, you're not going to see that they're a drunk. You're not going to see that they're living in all this sin and all this other stuff. They're going to look clean. They're going to look like a sheep. They're going to look like, like someone that belongs in church. That's the facade that they're putting up. But their action, the things that they do will prove what they, what they are and what they believe. And it's going to be their fruits. And it's not just their actions, but it's also their, their proselytes, right? Because these are false prophets. What do prophets do? They go and try to proselytize and get followers and get people to, to follow them. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? He's like, do you go to the, to the thorn bush to try to get something good out of it? No, I mean, you don't go into the bramble and the bushes and the thorns to get grapes or to get figs. He says, even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Their fruits, what are they producing? But this is to figure out if someone is a false prophet or not. What we saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and you can flip back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, the Apostle Paul is saying, you are the seal of mine apostleship. You are the proof. You are, I mean, you there at Corinth. You know, you can judge the Apostle Paul on his fruit. The church at Corinth is the fruit of Paul. He's the one spiritually that brought them the gospel and got them saved. And he's saying, look, you're the seal of mine apostleship in the Lord. The Apostle Paul was a prophet. He was someone who's going out and preaching the word of God. But he was not a false prophet. See, if, you're, if you are of God, if you are born again and you're a prophet, it's impossible for you to bring forth bad fruit. It's going to be impossible for me to bring forth a bunch of people that believe in works-based salvation. Why? Because I'm not preaching that. That is not the, pr the fruit that's coming forth out of my lips. When we go and we talk to people at the door, we preach them the gospel of Jesus Christ, we're not preaching them, but you got to work real hard at it. I can't do that. I wouldn't do that. Because I'm not a corrupt tree. And you, if you're saved and if you're a prophet, if you're, if you're preaching Jesus Christ, hey, the, the people that you win to Christ are going to be your fruit. Other Christians, when you've reproduced yourself in somebody else, that's you bringing forth fruit. The apple tree brings forth apples. The Christian tree brings forth other Christians. And that's how you could know whether or not somebody is a false prophet or not. So if they have a bunch of people following them, but none of them are saved, guess what? They're a false prophet. <coughs> the Bible also says in 2 Timothy 4, 5, you don't have to turn there, but watch thou in all things Endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. So making full proof of his ministry, when he does the work of an evangelist, he goes out and gets people saved, that is the full proof of his ministry, is the other people that you're reaching and that you're impacting and that you're winning to the Lord, that will be the full proof. And that's why the Apostle Paul said, you're the seal of his, they are the seal of his apostleship. And even in Matthew 7, we can judge prophets based on their fruit. Now, it's important to note here, as we get into this, that the Apostle Paul was not a pastor of a church. He was not an elder. He was not a deacon. These are offices that are scriptural offices in the New Testament church. But the Apostle Paul did not fill those positions. He was an apostle. That was definitely a position that he had. But he was not a pastor. Now, other of the apostles were pastors. We could see from the scripture that Peter and John, both of them were pastors of churches or elders. Elder is a term they use. Elder and pastor are used synonymously through the Bible. I'm not going to prove that to you now. You can look it up for yourself. In uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1, you don't have to turn there. 
The Bible reads, this is, of course, the epistle of Peter, the apostle Peter writing. He says, the elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder. So right there we can get from Scripture that the apostle Peter was also a pastor of a church. He was an elder. And in 2 John verse 1, the Bible reads, the elder unto the elect lady and her children. And who's doing the writing there? The Apostle John. It's the epistle of John, the apostle, who's writing and he's saying that he is an elder, the elder unto the elect lady. So both of them from the scripture, we see that they were elders. And also from the scripture, because of the, the requirements laid forth for a pastor, we know that they were married and had children. They were supporting a family. This will be important in a little bit, but I want to I point this out. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, if you would, where we were. Verse number 3. He says, Mine answer to them that do examine me is this. Have we not power to eat and to drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord, and Cephas? So, He's saying, look, to those people that want to examine me, don't I have the power to eat and to drink? Don't I have the power to lead about a sister, a wife, a, a believing wife? That's what it says, a sister, a wife, because everyone who's born again are brothers and sisters in Christ and that we ought to marry someone who is a believer in Jesus Christ, not to be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. So he says a sister, a wife, not a physical sister. Right? He's talking about a sister in, in the Lord, as well as the other apostles, because the apostle Paul wasn't married. He's saying, well, don't I have the power? Couldn't I get married right now if I wanted to? Get married to a believing woman and lead a wife? He says, just as the brethren of the Lord, he's talking about the, the, the physical brethren of Jesus Christ, you know, James and his other brethren that he had, or, and he says, and Cephas. Cephas is the apostle Peter, right? And we know that the apostle Peter, which... The Catholic Church likes to say is the first pope, right? Peter is the first pope. And of course, in the Catholic Church, you know, popes can't, priests can't get married. You need to remain celibate and all this other nonsense. When in many, pla in multiple places in the scripture, it refers to Peter having a wife and being an elder of a church, being a pastor or a bishop. Yet he was married. And Apostle Paul is saying, look, I could get married if I want to. Verse number 7. Oh, verse 6. Sorry, I skipped 6. Or I only and Barnabas have not we power to forbear working. He's saying, don't I have the power to not work anymore? So here's one of the things about the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul labored. He said he labored night and day. And he, he would give people an example of how they ought to work. The Apostle Paul would work with his hands in order to support himself. And this is one of the things of his ministry that he decided to do. And we'll get into this more as we read this, that this is his personal decision. That instead of receiving money and receiving food or receiving anything for the work that he's doing for the Lord, he says, you know what? No, I'm going to show you how this is done. I'm going to work with my hands. He was a tent maker by occupation. He would work, he would earn his own living, and he would still preach the word of God and do all this other work for the Lord. He, would, he did both. But what he's saying here, he's like, don't Barnabas and I have the power? Because Barnabas was a worker with him. He's like, don't we have the power to forbear working, which means to stop working? Don't I have that power to just give up this work and just serve the Lord and receive basically payment for what I'm doing? Because he's saying he absolutely has that right or that ability or that authority that's granted on him because that is right and true for him to be able to get paid for the work that he's doing. But he is personally deciding not to do that. Now, it's important, uh, so as I mentioned, I wanted to just point this out. First of all, Paul's not married and he doesn't have a family to support, right? And he's not the pastor of a church. And he's just saying, look, I'm doing these things, but I have the power not to. Verse 7, who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Now, this word has his own charges. You know, who's going to go to war 
and you have to pay for everything, right? Like any, I mean, think about any country in the world that has an army. The people aren't responsible for paying their own way through the army. Well, you have to bring the weapons, you have to bring the clothing, you have to bring the food, you have to, you know, like at your own charges, now you're going to send you off to war. No. When the war is declared, you know, they round up the troops, the army comes, but then it's prov all their munitions, all of their food, everything is provided for. It's not at their own charges. Hey, we're sending these guys off to war, so we're going to equip them and give them everything that they need in order to go and fight this war. Right? I mean, that's, that makes perfect sense, too, and that's the way things are done. He's like, who, who does it at their own charges, at their own cost? And he's likening this, as we'll read in a few other places here, to a few other, within the same verse. We're in a spiritual warfare, right? We're in a battle. And those that are at the front lines, those that are serving God, those that are the troops that are, that are witnessing, that are, that are preaching the word, that are, that are doing all the things that are supposed to be doing and holding these positions, it's, it, it just makes sense for them to be getting paid. Also, let's keep reading here. In verse 7, it says, Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? If you're going to put in all the work of planting a vineyard, he's like, you don't plant your own vineyard and then don't eat anything from it. Like, that's ridiculous. Of course you're going to partake of, of the work that you've done. Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? You don't put in all this time and effort into having a flock of, of goats or whatever and, and not be able to partake of the benefit of having those animals. You know, you, you put all this effort forth to care for them. Of course you're going to receive back from them. It only makes sense. Verse 8, Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? He's saying, look, am I just saying this as, as just a human being? As just, oh, well, we see these things around us, that's true. He's like, no, the law even says this. God's law says this, not the law of the land, God's law, because he quotes Moses in verse number 9, for it is written in the law of Moses, thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. What does that mean? You have an ox, or you use oxen in those days to, to grind corn down into power, into a meal, meal right? Corn meal. And you can make bread and make all kinds of things with that. So they're using an ox, and what the, what the Bible's saying here is that don't put a muzzle over the mouth of the ox that's doing all of this work for you. It's only right to let the ox eat a little bit of the meal that's being ground up that he's working on, right? And they would put it in an area and probably like walk around in a circle, or whatever, and just keep trampling and trampling and trampling and grinding it down. And it was just doing a lot of labor, a lot of work. <laughs> And that is something that was in the Bible. Now, he goes on to explain this. He says, doth God take care for oxen? He said, do you think God really cares about that ox eating while it's working? He says, or saith he it all together for our sakes? So don't you think he put this in the law? It's, it's not just because he cares about that, you know, because he's the, the president of PETA and that, you know, we need to make sure that we're treating these animals like humans. No, that's not at all why he did it. We have dominion over the animals. It's not that he cares about the animal. He's, do, he's saying that he put that in the law for a reason, for our sake, so we can learn from it. He says, for our sakes, no doubt this is written. And this isn't just Paul's opinion. He's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. God's word saying, it's written for our sakes that he that ploweth should plow in hope and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. He said the work that you do, you should be able to partake of that a little bit in order to keep going. He says in verse 11, he explains it even further. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing? if we shall reap your carnal things. And that's the main point that he's trying to make. Look, we're sowing unto you. We're, we're preaching God's word. We're sowing the word of God. These are spiritual things. These are much greater things than the world rose. I mean, this is what we're supposed to seek first, right? The kingdom of God and his righteousness. That is, that is the, the, the primary focus in our life is, ought to be 
receiving God's word and understanding more about God's word and applying God's word to our life. And he's saying, look, the people that are doing this job of trying to help you with that and trying to break this down and help you understand it and that are going out and, and reaching, bringing this word to other people to help them out. Look, that's a lot of work and that's a great thing. So is it really a big deal? Is it really a big deal that if you have a person who's doing this type of spiritual work for you to just kick in a little bit of carnal things, a little bit of just some money or whatever it is that's going to help this guy out who's doing this work? Is that really a big deal at all? That's what he's saying. He's like, is that a great thing? Should we be caught up about, oh man, I can't believe that the pastor's getting paid to do all this stuff? Like, Look at the work that he's doing and the importance of that work versus whatever money is coming in. Who cares? Is that really a big deal? It shouldn't be. I mean, we let the ox eat, eat the, the corn that he's grinding up and he's working with. Shouldn't we let the pastor or the evangelist or whoever eat while they're doing their work so that they don't have to worry about doing both? that they can actually just focus on the work that they're doing. Look at verse number 12. If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. So <coughs> Paul specifically, he's saying he has the power. He knows he has the power. Just as much as he has the power to go and get married and lead about a wife, he also has the power to forbear working. He has the power to require of the church that they recompense him some carnal things for the spiritual work that he's doing. He has that power. But he is choosing not to use that power. Why? Because he says he doesn't want to hinder the gospel of Christ. He's thinking at this point, I want to do as much as possible. Now look, I could put myself in this situation. As a pastor of this church, I, for the past two years, I have not received any money as income for myself as, as for doing the job that I'm doing. Now, would it be a big deal if I paid myself money of the, of the money that comes in, the carnal things for the spiritual work that I'm doing here for the church? No, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be a big deal. It should be no problem at all. And there's no problem with that at all. Actually, it's scriptural to get paid. But I am choosing not to to this point because I am trying to not to hinder the gospel. I, I, I like to be able to get all of the resources that we have and get as much back out and use the money as wisely as possible to get the message out, to make it bigger, to reach more people as much as possible. Right? That's, that's my motivation and goal for not taking a paycheck at this point. However, what suffers as a result is all of my time is not being spent at this because now I do have a family, I do have a wife and children that I do need to provide for, and I'm working for them, and I have to. But right now, our church is not to the point to even fully support our family so that I could just be ministering unto the spiritual things. But it wouldn't make it wrong, and I'll, I'll tell you this right now, that there is going to come a day, maybe even this year, I'm not sure yet, where I will be receiving money from the church for the work that I'm doing. Because I literally have two jobs. And it's not that I'm complaining about it, because I don't. It's fine. It's something that I love to do. I want to serve God. It's not about the money. I don't preach for filthy lucre's sake, which is obvious. Anyone who's been coming here or listening to the sermons knows that I don't just tickle the ears of the people that come in because I want them to, to give me more money. That has nothing to do with it. And that is an abomination because there are false prophets out there that are simply preaching for filthy lucre's sake. But just because you have bad false prophets out there that want to tarnish the name of Christ, that want to bring a bad report on the things of the Bible, does not make it wrong for a pastor or a preacher to be paid. And I think it's ridiculous and, and for these, you know, it's, it's basically this house church movement that's really against this. And this house church movement people, they want to throw these names out and they call a pastor and say, oh, you're just a hireling. And they try to make it sound like it's this real bad, you know, like you're a hireling. Like as if they're preaching just for money. 
which just because a pastor gets paid does not mean that their intent is to preach to get paid. Two different things. You could receive a blessing, you could receive a payment even for doing the job, but it doesn't mean that that is the reason why you're doing it. And they judge the intent of the heart of the preacher. And they call pe preachers like this, it boggles my mind, they'll call people hirelings as if they're only preaching for money to people who have preached harder than they've ever heard anyone preach before that has, has gotten plenty of people to leave a church because the truth is being preached and thundered and there is no compromise to God's word. Yet people have the audacity to, to, to bring railing accusations against pastors that are actually receiving money for the work that they do for the church as if it's a bad thing. The Apostle Paul chose not to use this power. But mind you, again, it's a little bit easier for the Apostle Paul not to use his power when he doesn't have a family to support, when it's just him. The amount of work required just to support yourself and to be able to do the things the Apostle Paul did, it's not as much. It's not as much. When you have five other mouths to feed, guess what? The workload is going to be increased in how much you have to be working in order to even provide for that as opposed to one mouth to feed. I mean, if it's, with, if it's just me, I could go without meals. I mean, I could fast. I could do all kinds of things to really minimize how much money do I really need to take care of myself. It's not very much. I can make ends meet. And this is, this is part of the idea, I think, that the Apostle Paul was expressing earlier when he's talking about marriage and you know how he's, he thinks it's better just to remain unmarried because then you can just serve the Lord. You don't have to worry about the things of this world. You don't have to worry about your wife. You don't have to worry about these other things. You could completely dedicate your life to serving God. And there is something to be said for that. That is a good thing to do. And praise the Lord for the people that do that. Amen. Praise the Lord for the Apostle Paul that did that. But you have to recognize that he's also in a slightly different situation than a pastor who's required to be married and have children in order to even hold that position. In order to be deemed acceptable as a pastor, as an elder in a church, you have to have meet those requirements. And I think that's also why he says, or I only and Barnabas have not we power to forbear working. Because they were working, so he's saying, don't we have the power to stop working? Be, why? Because the apostle Peter and John, the elders, they already had stopped working. They stopped working when Jesus Christ called them from their boats and they forsook all and followed Jesus. When Jesus Christ said in Luke chapter 5, verse number 10, the Bible reads, And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. Remember, James and John and Peter were all fishermen. And they were actually partners together. They did their, their fishing business as partners. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. Henceforth, what does that mean? From this day forward. From this point on, you're going to catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. They left their nets. They left their boats. They left that life behind them. They no longer will be in the fishing business. From that day forward, now they're going to go catch men. This is the job that the Lord Jesus Christ called them to do as his apostles. He didn't want them working anymore. He wanted them full-time serving him. And guess what? That's what they did. They followed him everywhere that he went. They preached the word. When he, they were sent out to preach the gospel, that's exactly what they did. They didn't go back to fishing. Now, there is one point. You could turn, if you would, if you would uh, to John 21, where Peter does go back to fishing. After the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Peter goes back to fishing. Now, it may not explicitly say so, but I think you can get from the reading of the passage that we're going to read right now in John 21, that that is not what Jesus Christ intended for him to do. And in a way, he's rebuking him here. 
for going back and just going back to his old life of fishing instead of going out and preaching the gospel and continuing to do the work that he had started with Jesus Christ. Verse number 3 of John 21, Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. Right? So at this point, he's just saying, okay, guys, guess what? I'm going fishing. They say unto him, we also go with thee. So he, now he's bringing these other people with him to go out fishing. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. Now, I'll tell you what, when you, when you decide that you're going to just back out on, on serving God, you've been serving God, you've been doing all this work, but then you say, you know what, I really don't want to do this anymore. I'm going to go because I think I can make a lot of money or I could do this other hobby and do this other thing and just spend all my time doing that. God's not going to bless that at all. If I were just to, to, to close up shop here and just say, you know what, this isn't really working out that well. There's not a whole lot of people here. We're just going to close the doors. I'm going to forget. I'm going to retire from being a pastor. And I'm just going to go off and, because my job needs me to be working harder at that and just make a lot more money. I believe that that job would just fail if I just turn my back on, on serving and doing the work that God has called me to do just to go and, and get some filthy lucre or, or, or just do something else. It's not going to work. And here we see they, they toiled all night. They caught nothing. Verse number four. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have you any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. <clears throat> and again, this is showing that when you go out just in your own strength and in your own power, it's very easy to fail at that. But if you can just trust Jesus and just listen to what he has to say, he's able to provide for you abundantly. You don't need to be going out and doing this work. And the, the apostle Peter and James and John, they didn't need to go out fishing in order to be provided for. Jesus was fully capable of taking care of them, as he did with the, with the fishes and the loaves, with the feeding of the 5,000 and the 4,000 during his ministry. He makes it happen. You'd be in the middle of the wilderness, and all of a sudden, Jesus is able to provide for you. Amen. Just as he's able to do here. And he's showing them that again. And this also brings to their memory what happened way back early on when they first started following Jesus. And their nets break. Remember that? We told them to let down the nets, and they only let down one net instead of letting down multiple nets, and then the, the, the net broke. Let's jump down to verse number 9 here in John 21. As soon as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon and bread. Jesus already had fish and bread. He already had what they needed to be provided for. It was already there. They didn't even need the fish that they brought back with them. They were already taken care of. Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fishes which ye have now caught. So he tells them, Okay, come on, bring them together. <coughs> Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land, full of great fishes, and 150 and three. And for all, there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus then cometh and taketh bread, and giveth them, and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to, to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Joseph, Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. So I tell him, Look, your job's not over. Do you love them more than you love me? Do you love going out and fishing with your buddies more than you love me? He says, Of course not. No, you know that I love you, Lord. Feed my lambs. Do you think Jesus is talking about physical lambs? Do you think he had a flock of sheep at his house and he's like, go back and feed my lambs? No. Obviously, he's talking about something spiritual here. He's talking about feeding new believers. Sheep. Lambs, right? Lambs are young, young sheep. Sheep are often referred to as believers in Jesus Christ. You need to go feed them. This is the job for you to do, Peter. It's not the boat. 
And then he says to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He said to him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest I love thee. He said to him, Feed my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Now, obviously, there's a lot of things going on here. And he asks him three times because you remember three times Peter denied the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, three times Jesus is asking him, hey, do you love me more than these? But he's also driving home a point. Look, feed my sheep. This is what I want you to do. Get out of the stupid boat where you're naked and shamed. Get back to serving me and feed my sheep. That's what I want you to do. Jesus did not want him going off and doing this work anymore. He called him away from that. So if Peter's job is to sow spiritual things, right? Feeding the lamb, feeding the sheep, if that's his job, is it a great deal if he gets recompense for that, if he reaps carnal things? Because Jesus is already telling him, hey, look, I don't want you going out fishing. I mean, that was his, that was his occupation. If he, if he was supposed to make money, and think about this now, this makes sense. It would only make sense if Jesus Christ expected the Apostle Peter, who was an elder, to have to have a job in order to provide for his family as well as being the pastor of a church, being an elder and doing that work also. Because this is what the house church movement teaches. Is that in order to be right with God, hey, you got to do, you know, if you're independently wealthy, great. But if you have to work to provide for your family, then you have to work that you shouldn't be getting paid for being the pastor of a church. That like that's wrong. If that were truly the case, why would Jesus make it so hard on Peter then to wear, well, I guess I can't be a fisherman, but, I, but I, have to, I still have to work to provide for my family, so I'm going to go and learn some other occupation and probably make a lot less money because it's not what he was good at. It's not what his trade was. It's not what he'd been doing his whole life. Wouldn't it make more sense and free up more time for Peter to do the work of an elder if he was just able to do, be the fisherman again and just be able to use it? I mean, I'm a computer programmer. I've been working for over 10 years at the job that I'm doing. Right? And over those years, you earn more and more money because you have more experience and you're more valuable at what you do. It's the same thing with, with, with Peter's situation with being a fisherman. He's going to be better and better at what he does. And it's something you learn over time and get experience and you earn up more money. For me now, just to say, well, I guess I got to get a whole new trade. God didn't want me doing this for some reason, but I still need to work and pastor the church now. It doesn't make any sense. I mean, it only makes sense that, that God wants all of the, all of the elders and, and pastors and the people he puts in these positions to work at it as much as possible. I mean, why would you not want that? And in order to do that, receiving carnal things, receiving the money, receiving the food that's necessary to feed your family and clothing and these things that, that are just basic necessities... If, you, if I don't have to go off and do this other job, I could spend all my time doing this. Who wouldn't want that? I mean, I've thought about this many times in other church, in, other, in, in Faithful Word where I went to there, you know, how great it would be for the pastor of that church when he, wasn't wor when he was working. Hey, how awesome would it be if he could devote all of his time for that? I mean, if we just pick one person in his room and say, hey, we're all going to pull our money together so that you can just serve God 100% with all of your time and energy and effort. Praise the Lord. That would be a great thing to do. Why, that, I mean, it only makes sense. But it's not just a good idea. Power is given for people in these positions to receive that money as a right thing to do. It's rightful. It's not just a good idea. It's actually biblical and scriptural. The Bible says, yeah, I didn't even finish here in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Flip back, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Because Paul said, and Barnabas, they're saying, you know, we haven't used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Verse 13, do ye not know that they which minister about holy things 
live of the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. Now he's talking about, you know, um, serving the Lord. He's talking about things, you know, the people that minister about the holy things live of the things of the temple. You know, the Levites, they actually lived the, the way that they survived because they served God full time. That was their job. God called out the Levites and said, okay, the Levites don't get an inheritance. They don't get the, the same thing that everyone else gets because I'm calling them to work for me. But as God's servants, guess what? They're there. They're, they're performing the sacrifices. They're doing everything the way that God told them it needed to be done. And, and they're responsible for keeping the house of God and, and offering these up. So whenever they offer up the sacrifices, they get a portion of that. They're doing this work, but they're also then being able to receive of that because they're partakers with the altar because that's the work that they're doing. Verse number 14, even so, in the same manner that the Levites get paid, even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Those people are going out and... and is it required of a, of, a, of a pastor to preach the gospel? Yes. You better believe it is. How else are we going to go out and, and, and fulfill the Great Commission and, and make disciples if we don't have a church to bring them to? You know, what, who am I going to be preaching to if we're not going out and preaching the gospel to people and bringing them in and getting them baptized and discipled? He was ex exhorting... Um, Timothy to make full proof of his ministry. We read that already. If he had to make full proof of his ministry, how's he going to do that? By winning converts? They which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Now, if you want to see, I could just read this for you, but in Deuteronomy chapter 14, actually, I want you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5. Because in the Old Testament, the tithe was to go to the Levites. Now, I believe in the New Testament that the tithe has not been done away. That this continued in the local church, in the, in the church, in the New Testament, that the, the, the concept of a tithe is not gone. It's not abolished with the old law. In Deuteronomy 14, 28, the Bible reads, And at the, at the end of three years, thou shalt bring forth all the tithe of thine increase, the same year and shalt lay it up within thy gates. And the Levite, because he hath no part nor inheritance with thee, and the stranger, stranger is a foreigner, and the fatherless, and the widow, which are within thy gates, shall come and shall eat and be satisfied, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hand which thou doest. So the tithe that was brought... It says after three years, they, you know, people bring the tithe. The Levite partakes of that tithe. Now, the people bringing the tithe, they're bringing the tithe to God. That's what they owe to God because it's a commandment of God. He says, you have to give me the tenth of all of your increase. That was a law. That was a commandment. But what God decided that he wanted to have done with that tithe then is saying, okay, this is how we are going to provide for the people who are doing the service of the Lord, who are working for me, these Levites that I've called to do my work, they're going to, get, they're going to be taken care of with the tithe, as well as the fatherless and the widow and the foreigner. Other people that don't have the means to be able to take care of themselves. A widow, right? Someone who's, especially a, a female widow, right? Someone whose husband passed away. And he was her source of being provided for. Well, now she has the church to take care of her, right? The fatherless. You know, kids growing up, they don't have a father to provide for them. Of course, they're going to be taken care of also. And even the foreigners, it could, you know, compassion on a foreigner who's, you know, maybe they don't speak the language and they can't find any work. Yeah, they're going to take care of them too. Okay, so that was what the tithe went to support in the Old Testament. The reason why I believe 
this hasn't been done away with, that the tithe hasn't been done away with, is because we see the church having the same responsibilities as the church did in the Old Testament. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 5. And so many people don't get this and they don't understand. It's a real simple concept, but they'll see a word like verse number 3 says, honor widows that are widows indeed. And they'll say, oh yeah, that word honor just means respect. Just means respect. No, I preached an entire sermon about this in the past. The word honor, does it mean respect? Yeah. But that's not the only meaning it carries. That is not the only meaning that honor carries. We saw, and I don't even have this in my notes, but when Jesus Christ was rebuking the Pharisees, he says when, when they had put the tradition of men above the commandment of God, he rebuked them when they said, it is korban, meaning a gift, whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me. When the, when the Pharisees would say that to their own father, to their own parents, well, consider it a gift, whatever I do for you. Jesus said that they're making the commandment of God of none effect, and then he quotes, honor thy father and mother. So that word honor there is talking about taking care of your parents financially, not just, well, I'm going to speak to them with respect. No, they were talking about giving them something, profiting by them, increasing by them, and saying, well, that's just a gift. No, we're commanded by God to take care of our parents when they get older, not just to leave them out. Hey, they're the ones that brought you up. You better show not just respect, but the respect where you're going to be taking care of them. That is honor. It goes deeper than just a mind respect or a verbal respect. What good is it going to do the widow that has no one to take care of them just to receive honor when they come in get the door for them and help them to their seat and they have no means to help themselves but we'll see even from this chapter that when it says honor widows that are widows indeed because he gives all the qualifications of a widow that is one that would be taken care of by the church that this word honor isn't just talking about respect because he goes through this whole list of well if they have family if they have you know if they've been serving God if they've been doing all these things then they are a widow indeed otherwise they're not you know if they have other means and other you know other uh, available if they have, they have family at home hey let them take care of them it says in verse 16 if any man or woman that believeth have widows let them relieve them what do you think it means by relieving them Relieving their stress, relieving their burdens by taking care of them. It says, and let not the church be charged. Charged. Charged with taking care of them. Charged and, and putting forth the food or the help or whatever it is that they need because they're a widow. That it may relieve them that are widows indeed. So the church's job is to relieve them that are widows indeed. Just as much as it was back in the Old Testament. Now, how do you think the church is going to do that? By the tithe that's brought in. I mean, why would God change his plan all of a sudden? Hey, the tithe was instituted so that we can take care of the Levites, the fatherless, the widows, and the strangers in the Old Testament. The New Testament, you still got to take care of the fatherless and the widows and the people serving God. But all of a sudden, now it's not going to come from the tithe. And, and I'm not going to tell you where it comes from. You're just going to have to figure it out. <coughs> but because we're in the New Testament, it's changed and that's done away. That's ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense. No, it says to that the widows need to be taken care of. And even in Acts, even in the book of Acts, stay in, stay in 1 Timothy chapter 5 because we're not done there. In the book of Acts... People were complaining, the Greeks were complaining that their widows were not being taken care of. Another indication that it is the church's responsibility to take care of widows. I'll read from you from Acts chapter 6, verse 1. And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews. The Greeks that were getting saved now that were coming to church, 
they were starting to have a problem with these, with these Hebrews, you know, with these old Jews. You know, they, they're all believers. They're all part of the church. But he's saying, hey, you know, we're kind of getting left out in the cold here. You know, you guys have, have, have preached the word of God to us. We're saved. Amen. You know, but it says, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. So the church, part of their job was every day ministering, helping out widows. So they had a daily job at the church. Why? Because you need food every day. You need to be help, helped out, taken care of every day. So part of the church's function and job was to take care of these widows on a daily basis. But the church has grown so big, and you have all these Greeks out there now, which I'm, I'm guessing they probably didn't live together. I mean, there's probably a lot of segregation. You can see that the way that the, the Jews' dealings and the Greeks and stuff, that they were completely separate. They, they had a different mindset for a long time of looking down on them as kind of being a lower-class person, subhuman, whatever. And that was a big deal throughout the Bible of the Jews being able to recognize, hey, God's opened this up to everybody and that we should not call unclean what, what God has cleansed, that call not thou unclean. And God has cleansed the Gentiles and the Greeks through the blood of Jesus Christ. You can't call them unclean. You know, there, and there was problems in the book of Acts, you see, where there was um, even Peter and James, you know, they were, even Barnabas, who says, was swept up with, the, with what was going on with them picking up and not eating with the, the Gentiles. And the Apostle Paul had to come and straighten it out and be like, look, you're going to hold them to the law now and, you know, that, that you couldn't even follow? And he had to rebuke them because they were, they were in error by, by treating them any different. But here we see the Greeks, it says their widows were neglected. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples and unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. So now the apostles are saying, look, we shouldn't leave the work that we're doing for God, leaving the word of God, preaching God's word, and go and serve tables. Why? Because they were taking care of the widows, because that was one of the functions, one of the jobs they had to do. So they're saying, well, we need to keep doing what we're doing. We can't be bothered with this work. Now, was, is serving the widows a good work? Absolutely it is. That also falls as to one of the obligations of a church. Why in the world would they say, hey, I've got an idea. We shouldn't leave the word of God and go and serve tables and take care of these widows. Why would they be saying that if they would say, oh, well, I'm going to stop serving the word of God now because... I have to go to my secular job to pay for my family. Wouldn't they have the same type of thinking here? Like, hey, why should I go serve tables just to feed my family when I can be working and serving God and, you know, I shouldn't have to leave the word of God? It says, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So he's saying we are going to continue to do this. We will continually give ourselves to prayer and ministering the world word. That's what we're going to do full time, all the time. Not even take a break to help these widows out. Because we're going to appoint other people to help in that task. This is the way a church is run. And it is legitimate for a church to be taking care of widows it is absolutely is what they should be doing and that money comes in from the tithe and that tithe comes in to pay for the men doing the service of the lord so that they don't have to take a break from ministering the word and the more people there are in the church Praise the Lord, the, the better it is and the more people you can add. And that's why you look out people, even the people that were doing that task, you could say, oh, it's, it's not that big of a deal to help out a widow. They said, choose you out seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost. I mean, people who are soul winners, people who are serving God, people who were respected within the church <coughs> to do this type of work. It wasn't just some low level thing. It was still a very important job that they picked out, they chose men that were worthy. One of those men was Stephen. Remember Stephen the martyr? 
He was one of those people that was full of the Holy Ghost that they chose to do to perform that job. The jobs within the church are very important, and caring for people is a very important job. And it ought to be treated as such. It's not just some, some little thing. So let's, you're in 1 Timothy chapter 5. All of that, showing all the evidence of taking care of widows, right? And it's the church's job. And we saw in 1 Timothy chapter 5 that we need to honor widows that are widows indeed. The reason I went into all of this, showing that, that honor means taking care of and providing for, because in 1 Timothy chapter 5, look at verse 17, then the Bible talks about the pastors or the elders. <laughs> Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. And the people who want to deny that pastors should be getting paid, when you show them this verse, oh yeah, that just means respect, that they should just be highly respected. Then why is he talking about taking care of the widows and providing for them? Using the same word, honor. It fits perfectly with the way that God had ordained the Levites to be taken care of, who did the service of the Lord with the widows and the, you know, and the fathers, and the New Testament church. It all fits. There's no reason to think it's any different. That the tithes would not be used to pay for a pay. And especially if you've got a pastor who's doing, um, that's ruling well, and that labors in the word and doctrine, who does a lot, puts forth a lot of work, who's really working hard at this, why wouldn't they be counted worthy of double honor? Give them a little bit more for all of the work that they're doing. Show your appreciation. Show your respect. Hey, count them worthy of double honor because they're working so hard at it. Now, look, if you got a pastor who's hardly doing anything, they're not going out soul winning. They're barely getting their sermons together. They're not really helping people. They're not doing the work and the job of a pastor. Then they're not worthy of double honor. And they shouldn't be getting it. But he's saying those that do labor in the word and doctrine, hey, count them worthy as double honor. Verse 18, for the scripture saith, and again, here's this verse again, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. And that reward there isn't talking about his spiritual reward because he was just talking about the ox that's, that's treading out the corn. He's talking about receiving physically because he's laboring so hard. Hey, he's worthy of it. He's done the work. Give him the honor of providing for him. Romans 15. Flip over to Romans 15. These topics are mentioned multiple times as we're jumping around to different, different passages. I don't think this could be any more clear. I can't believe how much time I've spent on this already. Romans 15, verse 25. But now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. For it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. So now he's saying, Apostle Paul is saying, look, I'm going to Jerusalem and the people of Macedonia and Achaia, they pulled together, they made a contribution for poor saints which are at Jerusalem just to help out people who are poor, poor believers, part of the church of Jerusalem. Great. Nothing wrong with that. Something very good to do. Verse 27, it hath pleased them verily and their debtors they are. Look at this. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. He said, look, it's your job. It's your, look, these Gentiles, they've been provided all the spiritual things, all the teachings and, and, and getting saved and everything else. And it's their duty. They, they, they need to be taken care of. Those that are ministering unto them and give them their carnal things, their, you know, a little bit of money. Yes, it's their duty. It's their responsibility. It's their job. It is required of them because people will say, oh, you know, tithe was required in the Old Testament. Now, you know, God loveth a cheerful giver, so, so there, it should not be given of necessity. And they take that out of context talking about alms, which are like free will offerings, different than the tithe, a separate type of an offering. 
But a tithe is required. And that's why it says here, it's their duty to minister unto them in carnal things. If it's your duty to do something, then it's, that's required of you. That's your duty. It's your duty as a son to take care of your parents. It's your duty as a parent to take care of your children. It's a duty. It's a job that you have that you are responsible for. When therefore I perform this, verse 28, and have sealed to them this fruit, I will come by you unto Spain. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm going to close out the rest of the chapter here. Man, we got a lot of verses to go, but I could do this. Ugh. Bear with me. I hope I'm not boring you tonight, but it's just, it, it drives me nuts to hear these people with the false doctrine saying that pastors shouldn't be paid and that people sit in the pews thinking that, oh man, who's this guy getting paid and stuff, when they have no idea, people have that type of attitude, have no idea the amount of work and labor and things that go into church. And to go into being able to teach, being able to prepare sermons and to look and study God's word and to be ready and, and to do all things, to take care of the people within the church. To do the job of a pastor is a lot of work. And the average person that just comes in, they live their whole life during the week, they come in, they sit down, they hear a message and judge and say, yeah, I don't know what that's doing for me. And have this attitude just about themselves, and then they leave and have no respect unto what the pastor is actually doing and all the work that goes into having the services and doing all the stuff. And then they want to say, Yeah, I, I, they shouldn't even be getting paid. I don't know why they get paid. Oh, what a cushy job. Yeah, right. Maybe it's cushy for the guy who doesn't do anything and they don't deserve. You know, they deserve whatever labor they're putting forth to be, to be rewarded for. But for the people who actually love God and, and, and are serving God with their heart and the amount of work that's involved, it is a lot of work. Amen. And even though I'm not even collecting any money, it still makes me angry that, there, that, that this false doctrine is out there corrupting people's minds. I am not a money-hungry person at all. And if you decide to tithe, that's between you and God. And I won't speak to you any different. I won't talk to you any different. You know, I won't look at you any different. But God still has that as part of his structure for the church. Is that tithes are required and alms are not. But he gives us that, that he, he's designed it in such a way so that the man of God can be provided for and taken care of because it is a lot of work, because it's a hard job to do. So we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Look at verse number 15. So again, the Apostle Paul is reiterating here, but I have used none of these things. Even though he has the power, I haven't done it. I haven't taken it. And I'm, I'm in the same boat right now. I haven't taken that power to take any money <coughs> to recompense for, for the work that I do here. Neither have I written these things that it should be so done unto me. Saying, I'm not even writing this so that you can do this for me. That's not the purpose of me writing this to you. For it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glorying void. He's saying, look, I'm doing this. And, and he's like, I'd rather die than just have someone to take this away from me. Because he's going above and beyond what would be legitimate or fine to do. He's, he's trying to do even more. And that's what he's saying. He's, saying. he's able to glory a little bit because he's going even further than that. He's saying, no, I'm not going to take any of it. We're going we're gonna to get the gospel out and use all of our resources to do that. And I'll suffer a little bit as a result. Verse 16, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, what is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. So he's saying, I have to preach the gospel either way. He's like, that's committed unto me. And that's the truth for all Christians. Hey, the, the gospel has been committed unto you. You need to preach that gospel. Whether you get paid or not, whether anything, any, any rewards that you get, and he's saying, you can't glory in the gospel for your, of yourself, right? 
He says, but if I do this thing willingly, if I, if I am just, just going to do this, then I am going to get a reward. And you'll get a heavenly reward by the souls that you saved. He says, but if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, saying, look, it's still, even if I don't want to do it, this job has been given to me. And he says that when he preaches the gospel, you know, he, he, shouldn't, he doesn't want to abuse his power because he has the power to be able to get paid, but he doesn't want to abuse that power now and then start charging people to hear the gospel. Right? Like we, don't, we don't have an admission fee to the church. It's all free. Freely we've received, freely we give. And um, he says, For though I be free from all men, verse 19, yet have I made myself servant unto all that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law as under the law that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak that I might gain the weak. I have made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. Now he's trying to explain the way that he's reaching people with the gospel of Christ. Saying he's going to the level, going down or up to the level of whoever it is he's talking to. You know, some people are like they're under the law. Well, hey, I'm going to go to them where they're at and try to reach them and try to, to connect with them in what, what, whatever their state they're in. He's like, I'm going to become all things to all men because I, I, my whole point is that I could save some of them. Now, don't take this too far. I've seen people saying, oh, well, you know, if you got a buddy and they like to go out to the bar and like go out and have a sit down next to them and have a drink with them and be right where they're at. This is disproven within the pages, within the verses here, because he says to them that are without law as without law. So you could go to them like you're without law, but being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ. So you don't do something sinful. You don't do something that's going to break God's law just to try to become all things to all men. You still have God's law that you're following. So you don't take it to that weird extreme of just saying, well, no matter what. And, you know, honestly, on a, on a different scale, this is why when we go out soul winning, we have church established time that we all congregate together. Soul winning is extremely important when we go out and preach the gospel to people. But there comes a time when you have to call it quits and you have to stop. Even if you're in a good conversation with someone, in order to make it back to church... We're going we're gonna to have to end that conversation and pick it up another time because there are certain things. And you know, it may be a silly example. It's not exactly like you'd be necessarily sinning, right? But there are things that you hold important and dear and that you're not going to budge on even while you're trying to become all things to all men. I know that wasn't the perfect application or example for what this is teaching here, but... We need to be able to, to reach people where they're at and have this type of an attitude too of caring that just because someone may be different than you or, and, and visibly and extremely different than you, try to find some common ground between them, you know, where you could connect with them and, and hopefully try to get them to listen to you. I mean, maybe you're talking to some foreigner, someone from a, from a foreign country and they dress different, they talk different, they're hobby, you know, try to find something that you could connect with them on, it'll be, e it'll be better than to give them the gospel with someone that, that you could have some sort of connection with. It'll make it easier. It'll be, you'll be able to do a better job with that. And that's what he's saying. He's like, like, I'm trying to become all things to all men here just so that they could be saved. Verse 23, And this I do for the gospel's sake that I might be partaker thereof with you. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain... And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. So he's talking about people who run in a race. Look, when there's a race at the Olympics or whatever, you know, they all run because they're all trying to get that gold medal. Right? They're all trying to get that prize. That's what they run for. And he says, every man that striveth for the mastery that wants to get that top, that gold medal, they want to get that top prize. It says they're temperate in all things. Temperate meaning 
they're able to control themselves in all things. So when you're, when you're a runner and you're training for a race like this, if they just are out of control, like with their eating or with their drinking or with not being able to, to be disciplined and go to bed at the right time, you know, if they do any of these things, it's gonna impact their ability to, to win. Right? They need to be disciplined in all areas of their life. They can't be getting distracted with all kinds of other things. You know, even mentally, they need to be on path in all areas if they're going to be the one to win that prize. Right? They're going to need to be able to wake up early and start training. They're going to need to be able to, to force themselves not to cheat on, on their, their, their diets, on their meals that they're eating, and make sure that they're only consuming what's best for their body and doing all that work right, in order to reach the mastery, in order to reach the top. He says, now they do that in order to obtain a corruptible crown. That, that, that piece of metal, that, that, that thing that they receive. It's corruptible. It's, what is it? I mean, really, it's just it's stupid, right? It's not a big deal. He says, but we, an incorruptible, we need to be able to keep ourselves temperate in all things as we're striving for the great spiritual rewards that God has for us. Hey, we're running a race too, so to speak. But our race is different from the world's race. Our race is run, we're trying to win souls to Christ. We're trying to do the walk, the path that God has laid out for us and, and do the most work to bring honor and glory unto the Son, Jesus Christ, and to bring as many people unto that as possible. That's the race that we're running. He says in verse 26, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. I don't run as uncertainly as the world does. He says, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. He's like, <coughs> in my fight, I'm not just like punching at nothing. I actually have a target. He says, but I keep under my body and bring it in, uh, into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So I'm doing it the right way. I'm keeping myself under subjection. And the last point I want to make, I'm going to bring up, I know we've gone a little bit longer than usual, but since we're on this chapter, we're on this verse, and, and I haven't done it in a while. You know, we're, we're King James only. And I just want to bring up to the false versions what, what they say on this verse just to point out how ridiculous they are and how they're not the Word of God just based on the things that they say. So this last verse that we read, but I keep under my body and bring it into, sub, into subjection. Does anyone have a hard time understanding what that means? Keeping under your body? Being in control of your body and bringing it into subjection, right? If, if your body's in subjection, you're the boss, right? I'm going to decide what I'm going to do with my body. My body's not going to be driving me this way and that way and just being in control of the things I do. I'm in control of my body. And he's saying, unless by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. He's saying, look, I'm going to do it the right way. I'm keeping my body under control so that I can be, you know, win the race, Right? I'm trying to reach that spot. Look at what the, the NIV says. I'll read it for you in verse 27. The NIV says, No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified as for a prize. I strike a blow to my body. Ugh! I'm making you my slave! You know, like literally saying, I strike a blow to my body. You think the Apostle Paul was beating himself? Just striking blows. But you know what? There are people that do that. There are Catholics that do that in the Philippines. And they think that they're doing God's service by you know, self-flagellation. And they actually do beat themselves. So you might say, like, like, oh, that's just a silly thing. Who would ever take that literally? There are people that do. This is not God's word. And then the, the new revised standard version. There's all these standard versions, right? I thought standard means there's one. Like the standard. You have the new American standard. You have the revised standard version. You have the, you know, all these different standard versions. The ESV, the RSV, the NRSV. But this one reads, But I punish my body and enslave it, so that after proclaiming to others, I myself should not be disqualified. Punishing your body isn't the same as bringing your body in subjection. Punishing is more like striking a blow, right? 
You don't have to punish your body. It's not a punishment to be in control of your body. To keep under your body. It's not a punishment. But that's what these verses say. And that, you know, you say, oh, it doesn't really affect any, any core doctrine. Yeah, but it's not God's word. God doesn't speak like that. God doesn't tell you to beat up your own body. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much <coughs> for the clear instructions you've given us, dear Lord. Thank you for, for the church that you've instituted and established, dear Lord, and all of the, the design that you have for it to be laid out makes perfect sense. Lord, I pray that you please help us not to be deceived by the, by the people who um, want to change the way that you've ordained the offices to be run and the way that the church ought to be handled, especially when it comes to um, pastors being paid and taking care of widows and all these other things, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us to just have a, a proper biblical understanding of these concepts, that we would have a good heart, that we wouldn't think it a big deal for the people who are, who are doing the, the spiritual work to be able to receive some of the carnal things, dear Lord, that we would just be able to uh, have a, a mind to want to do as much as possible for you as we can so that we could equip people to be soldiers, to go out and not have to worry about the little things like the mammon of this world, but to just be able to focus all of their attention on serving you, dear Lord. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.